why God waits to answer. Isaiah 30. Now wait till you arrive. I hear the rustling of the leaves. It's been said here at Times Square Church, if you don't come with your Bible, you're naked. This is your clothing. Amen. Robed with his word. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest till ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. But you said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall you flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will be exalt, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. When he hears your cry, he will answer thee. Hallelujah. We thank you, O God, for your precious word. Your word is our lamp, it's our strength. And I stand as a shepherd of this flock to humble myself before you, Jesus. And I ask for a special touch from heaven, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me speak as a shepherd does to his flock. Lord, I'm only one, but I ask you, Lord, to use this vessel this morning. Sanctify me, purge me, let me speak the pure, holy word that will produce life. Oh, God, we thank you for your presence here this morning. You were here since we opened the service, and you're going to be here all day. Now, Lord, apply the word to our hearts. Holy Spirit, bring forth unction. Bring forth an anointing. Let the word heal us this morning. Let the word strengthen us. Let the word uh, reprove us and rebuke us if it must, only to heal us, that you may be gracious unto us. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Why God waits to answer. Now, I've read to you from Isaiah chapter 30. Don't turn there, but it goes back to chapter 29. This is during the reign of Hezekiah in Jerusalem and Judea and in, in Judah. The prophet Isaiah is contemporary at this time along with the prophet Micah. These were the two prophets that spoke during these times. If you want to know how the times were uh, during this period that we're discussing this morning, you read the whole book of Micah and you get the picture of how Jerusalem and Judah are under judgment at this time. And Isaiah is sent by the Spirit of God to Jerusalem and the inhabitants there and God's people. And he's got a two-pronged message. First of all, he warns of a horrible warfare that was coming. And second, there was a promise of God's deliverance that they would simply trust and obey. <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah stands before God's people in Jerusalem, and he gives an awesome prophecy. He said, you're going to be going through a great test of faith, and this is all in the 29th chapter, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, there's looming before you a great test of faith. <clears throat> you're going to wake up one day, he said, and look out over the walls of Jerusalem. You're going to see the Assyrian army surrounding you. And he said, within one year, it's going to happen. You see, God always warns his people. He always warns us. And he's, the prophet Isaiah tearfully is standing before the people, and they're really being judged at this time for an apostasy. Apostasy. In the city of God, the place of his anointing, where his fire fell on the altar, <clears throat> was going to come under an attack. They would be besieged. And there's going to be such uh, a, a besiegement that there would be towers raised against them where there would be bridges made so that they could uh, go from their towers right to the top of the wall. They're going to be battering rams, battering the walls night and day to try to tear down the walls of security. These battering rams were going to be an attempt to crush every protecting wall. They were going to go through the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. 
They said, the, the prophet said, your trial is going to become so heavy, you're going to be humbled to the very dust, you're going to lay prostrate, and the only strength you're going to have left when this battle is over is just a bare whisper. You're just going to be able to whisper. All your strength is going to be gone. Now, folks, this sounds very familiar to me. It sounds like the same kind of warning the Holy Spirit has given to us in the New Testament. It's a warning that we, as God's people in the last days, are going to go through spiritual warfare, that the devil's going to come. You wake up one day and you're surrounded by enemies. You wake up one day and you find yourself in a battle for your life. You find the devil coming with his battering rams and his towers and bangs and hits, and everything out of hell comes against you. And there are people sitting among us here this morning in the balcony, main floor, around me, surrounding me. You don't know who they are. I don't know. Only the Holy Ghost does. He's the mind reader. And he knows exactly what you are going through this morning. He knew that all week, and he prepared a message for many of you. Some of you are visitors. God sent you here this morning to deliver you, to bring you into a new realm of discovery in the Spirit. He's going to help you this morning. If you just say right now, Holy Spirit, open my ears to hear. If you're sitting here this morning and your mind is wondering, bring it to captivity. Every thought to the obedience of the Lord Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is faithful to his flock. He is faithful to his people. Folks, we serve a loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing more than to deliver his people. He's called a deliverer. He is a deliverer. And that's what he has in mind for you this morning. Suddenly, some of you have been cast into the trial of your life. You're being tested in your faith. And some of you have been so overwhelmed, you've literally been crushed and humiliated. And you get up each day and you wonder if you can go on. There's a doctor in this church, a fine man of God, and just recently he was sued. And... Uh, taking a stand for the Lord and going through it. And he said, Brother Dave, every day I wake up, there's something new. There's something worse. There's always another evil report. I am being battered. I'm at my wit's end. I got a letter. Uh, you know, we receive uh, thousands of letters from our mailing list that our messages are sent all over the United States and around the world. <clears throat> and this week, a letter came to me from a sister in the Midwest. And she said, Dear Brother David, I attend a Holy Ghost-filled church. I've grown more in the past two years than in all my past life. But for the past six months, I've been going through a fiery trial of my faith. And I don't think I can take much more. Why does everything have to be so hard? I have met the devil face to face. And it seems like he hits me in some different way every day. Every day there's another evil report. He's been robbing me financially. He's trying to discourage me, so I'll quit. I've become so weary. It shows on my face and now in my attitude. Every day just brings more pressure. Why can't things settle down for a while? I bind Satan. I praise the Lord all times, but it seems to be to no avail. I know the word is true. I'm listening all day to godly tapes, but I can hardly make it through the day anymore. I'm so tired trying to be strong. I'm at my wit's end, and I really don't know what's happening. And we get letters like that from all over the world, people going through the test of their life. The prophet Isaiah sees this uh, <clears throat> message from the Lord. He hears the voice of the Lord, and he said, even though I warned you of what's going through, even though I have warned you, <clears throat> I'm telling you that God, if you'll trust him, is going to bring you through miraculously. God is going to deliver you. You're going to be surrounded by armies. You're going to have battering rams, battering at your walls. You're going to go through such a test that's going to bring you finally prostrate on your face in the dust where you can only whisper, but I'm telling you now, you don't have to do anything about it. You're going to just trust the Lord, and he's going to carry you through. And one day, in his time, every enemy will be gone. And it'll be just like a bad dream that passes away. <clears throat> he gave, in, in chapter 29, there are eight verses. The four first, four first verses of chapter 29 are all woes. What you're going through. 
Folks, hasn't the Holy Spirit warned us that we're going to be in spiritual battles? Hasn't he warned us that we're going to go into a fiery furnace? He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But he said, what's happening to you is common to all of God's people. But God will in his own time and his way make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Even though he warns us, he said, in the last days we'll be persecuted. We will be tried. And just when you think your strength is going to fail, when you're at your lowest, when all seems hopeless, at the peak of your crisis, the Bible says, God will take over. <clears throat> you read 29, Isaiah 29, verses 5 to 8. And oh, what, a, what tremendous promises are given here. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust. The multitude of the terrible ones. And in fact, in Hebrew, those very important people who come against you shall be as chaff that passeth away. It shall be as an instant, suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. And the multitude of those that come against Jerusalem, her aerial, even all that fight against her and her, mul- and her munitions and that have distressed her shall be as a dream and a night vision. And here's a wonderful promise. God says, the multitude of your enemies shall become like fine dust. The multitude of the ruthless, like the chaff, shall blow away. The Lord will visit upon your enemies, is what he's saying, with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with storm and tempest, and a devouring fire. And you know what the prophet is saying? Very suddenly, when you think it's hopeless, when you think you can't go another step, suddenly, suddenly, the Lord shall come with thunder and lightning and earthquake. The Assyrians who have schemed to destroy you will themselves be put to shame. And that's all through chapter 29 and also the first part of chapter 30. He said they're going to wake up into a delusion. They're going to have empty souls. The devil's plans and schemes will fade away like a bad dream. God will lift you up out of the pit of despair. And everyone who's come against you, wait, warred against you, shall be consumed with his voice. They will no longer distress you, and the dream will pass, and you will come into his glory. And you will come into the increase of bread, the scripture says. Your bread will be increased. It means the blessing of God. Folks, we today have even greater promises than they had. Scripture makes it very, very clear that we live in a time of greater promises. For he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. We have all the promises Jerusalem had, and we have all the promises of the New Testament. Yes, God has warned you. He has warned me. He has warned us all that there are times that come that are going to test the very righteous. And I want to tell you, and I want you to hear me well, the more righteous you are, The closer you walk to Jesus, the hungrier you are for him, the more you seek his face, the more you are going to be tried and tempted and tested as no other Christian. Dear sister on our mailing list, this is, uh, send us this note. Dear brother David, I feel that of the Lord to send you these encouraging words from Brother Frangipani's book, The Three Battlegrounds. And I want to read just a paragraph. And, and here's what it said. In these closing moments of this age, the Lord will have a people whose purpose for living is only to please God with their lives. You know there are people like that. Their only purpose for living is to please God. You know the price that kind of person is going to pay? In them, God finds his own reward for creating man. They become his worshipers. Oh, thank God for worshipers. If you are a true worshiper, watch out. They are on earth only to please God, and when he is pleased, they are pleased. The Lord takes them farther and through more pain and more conflicts than other men. Outwardly, these people seem to be smitten of God and afflicted. Yet to God, they are his beloved. When they are crushed like the petals of a flower, they exude worship, the fragrance of which is so beautiful and rare that angels weep in quiet 
at their surrender. One would think that God would protect these who worship. He would guard them in such a way that they would not be marred or broken. Instead, they are marred and broken more than any other men. Indeed, the Lord seems pleased to crush them, putting them to grief. For in the midst of the physical and emotional pain, their loyalty to Jesus Christ grows pure and more perfect. In the face of persecution, their love and worship toward God becomes all-consuming. Folks, that's the purpose of suffering. That's the purpose of being tried, that God may bring us to a place of sweetness, a place of rest, that we can come to this, he said, in, in quietness and confidence shall be your security, that you're secure because you have test, you've been tested of the Lord and you didn't murmur, you didn't complain, you didn't quit, but you grew in Christ. It produced the nature of Christ. It produced the beauty of Jesus in you. That's why some of you are going through it. You can't understand it. But Pastor Dave, never have I loved him more. I've studied, I've wept, I've cried, I've prayed. I walked circumspectly before God. Why am I going through the trial that I'm going through? Some of it is financial for some of you. Some of it's children. Some of it's family. Some of it's physical. I don't know what you're going through today. Is it your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your, your children? Is it just your own physical pain? What is it you're going through? I don't know, but he does. But he said that's common. That is not to be considered something unusual. And if God doesn't deliver you immediately, I can tell you one thing. He'll give you all the grace you need to see it through. There was a persistent woman who cried night and day for justice and a vengeance. She kept coming to the judge. And the judge said, because she bothers me, I'll answer. But the Lord Jesus himself, and shall not God avenge or protect his own elect, which cry unto him night and day, though he bear along with them. I tell you, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. God said, make sure you understand that the Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will do it. Now, beloved, Jesus was the fulfillment given to all the prophets of the promise. You read about the promise all through the Old Testament. That was Jesus. That was the Messiah coming. It was given to all the prophets. I want you to go to Luke, please, the first chapter of Luke. I'm going to use something to give you great encouragement. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Luke 1, beginning to read verse 68. You should read this every week or every time you're downcast. Luke, the first chapter. Chapter, beginning read, uh, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is <clears throat> Zechariah speaking. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who is that power of salvation, that horn? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from what? Our enemies and from the hand of how many? All that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being what? Delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. How long? All the days of our life without fear. All the days of our life, God dealing with your enemies in in your household, your enemies on the job, your enemies on the street, demonic powers, principalities and powers of darkness, whatever it may be that comes against you, the Lord says, I will deliver you from all your enemies so that you live out all your days in peace and rest in the Lord. I want you to go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 30. The 30th chapter of Isaiah again. 
You see, God comes to Jerusalem with these wonderful promises. He said, if you'll call on me, I'll hear you. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. He said, if you'll simply call on me, I will hear you, and I will answer you. And he said, I will deliver you, and I'll handle all your enemies. <clears throat> but the scripture makes it clear that Israel, or rather that Jerusalem and Judah, did not listen to the prophet, did not listen to the word of God. And the scripture says they panicked, and they did not consult the Lord, but they had their own committee meetings. They met in private, and they said, who sees it? God doesn't see it. And they counseled among themselves, and they did not call on the name of the Lord. They didn't seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but they turned to the arm of the flesh. They got on swift horses and sent ambassadors to Egypt. They went to Zoar and, and, and to Haines, and they sent their ambassadors on swift horses, and they turned to the arm of the flesh. Look at chapter 30, verse 15, if you will, please. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Chapter 30, uh, no, that, that's uh, chapter 29, 13. I want you to uh, go to chapter 30, verse 13, 15 again. This is chapter 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest... Shall ye be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength and you would not. Now, folks, look at me, please. This is the prophet Isaiah standing before the people. He said, the Assyrians are coming within a year. And he said, all you have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. All you do is cry out to the Lord and he will come and deliver you. And while they're gathering around you, while all this turmoil is around you, you're going to have your mind at rest and peace. And that's going to be your strength. That's going to see you through if you'll just take my word. But he said, you would not. You would not listen to that. You wouldn't take it. They panicked. And they said, no, we want to see action. The Lord works too slow. Oh, isn't that just the way we are? God has made us great and precious promises whereby we're made partakers of his divine nature. You know the hardest thing it is for a Christian or a child of God to do is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We want something to happen. So we get on our swift horses just like Israel and we run down to Egypt. Egypt is flesh. Egypt is man-made methods. You see, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is our comforter. And, whether, and rather than accept that and rest in that, we run to our friends. We get on the telephone. We look for some human comforter. Who do you run to in your bridle? Who do you go to? Who hears your ear? Do you run to the Lord or do you immediately pick up your phone? You say, I've got a good friend. This friend has to, this friend will help me out. The Bible says Jesus is our healer. And rather than rest on that, we run to our doctors, we run to our hospitals, we run to our experts. We really don't trust the Lord. You and I know that. When we are in battle, when we're in trouble, we run to some counselor, we run. We have, we have Christians now that just go to the Christian bookstore. Look at all the people lined up on the how-to books. How to find happiness, how to solve your loneliness problem. There must be 10,000 books on how to, to overcome loneliness, written by lonely people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're trying to solve their own problems. God said, if you will seek me, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and turn to the left. All God said, Israel, or Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, will you just lean on me? Folks, I'm telling you, we don't do that. Somehow, this has to get into your heart. I've stood in this platform, in this pulpit, this past year especially, I've been looking back over the messages I've preached and the notes. Folks, I have preached more on this subject than any other subject this past year. Brother Carter has stood here and others have stood here trying to get us to believe God. 
not to lean on the arm of the flesh and to rest in his promises. It has been coming at us time and time again. And God must know, he must know, and I know he does, that many of us have been grieving him because I can preach the kind of message I'm preaching this morning about just trusting his word and leaning not on the flesh, but leaning on his word and his promises. And people will come up to me and say, Brother, that was a good word. I can meet him out on the street. Boy, that was good. Boy, the Lord touched me. That's Sunday by Wednesday. The trial is raging around them and you thought I hadn't said a word about trust. Everything they heard Sunday morning or Sunday night, they've forgotten. And they're on the telephone. They're in panic. They're on their swift horses running to Egypt. And I'm telling you, that wounded the heart of God. God was wounded. He's grieved. Because rather than being in a secret closet pouring out their hearts, they're then sitting in the council rooms with the Egyptians who were heathen worshiping idols. And they're pouring out their heart to these Egyptian lords. These very Egyptian lords that God once wounded and destroyed. The posterity of these people. And here they are with their seed sitting down in these council rooms saying, Look, the Assyrians are coming against us. We're going to be in the battle of our life. We are weak. We can't stand it. We will pay any price if you'll come and protect us. What does, how does the heart of God feel when his own children, having all these promises, turn away from him and run on swift horses to the camp of the Egyptians and they're unburdening and unbosoming themselves to these men? And God said, it's a shame. He said, they can't help you. And the prophet is incredulous. He can't believe their blindness. He said, you've, you've lost your discernment. Woe to the rebellious children that go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth. And they go to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And the prophet comes along and he said, you know why you don't hear the word of God? For the Lord's poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and he's closed your eyes. You so many times trying every battle has been a test. He's tested you and tested you, failed and you failed and you failed. And here they are at an ultimate test. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you've never heard anything ever been preached in this pulpit before, listen now. Listen to a pastor who's learning. I'm sorry I had to wait till I'm this age in my 60s to learn some of these lessons. But you can preach this gospel all your life. You can talk about faith. You can preach it. You can preach about trusting the Lord. But I want to tell you, it only comes through trials. It only comes through tests. And I wish I had learned in some of the former tests that I wouldn't have to be tested so severely at this time in my ministry and my age that I would have to go through such, such severe testing till I finally learned this lesson to just step back and trust God and call on his name and let him take care of everything. I have learned in a time of slander and abuse to stand still and see the salvation of God and not try to defend myself or the house of God. I used to be a fighter. There was a time 10 years ago, before I came to New York, you ever touched me? You came near me. You'll pick yourself up off the street. Bless God, I'm a prophet. I didn't say that, but I felt it. You touched me and you're dead. No, folks, that's all gone. And you know why? Because in the test, you're not to retaliate. You're not to take the battle in your own hands. You don't sit around questioning, is God doing this or the devil doing this? It don't matter. If he's chastening you, he said, blessed are you, whom the Lord loves. You say, well, God, you must love me an awful lot to test me like this. But some of you are not there yet. You're still fighting. 
somebody talks about you on the job, start a rumor, you go start another one. You're going to retaliate. You're going to get even. That's not the Christ way. The test you're going through, you're going to sit around. When, when do you stop complaining and say, oh God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? Lord, I've never loved you more than I do. Why, 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 why? That's the only word some of us get out of our trials. And the hardest thing to do, and I'm telling you this, and it's the only way, is to rest and stand still and say, God, teach me the lessons I want to learn. Open my mind. Open my heart. There's so much that he wants to teach us. You say, well, Brother Dave, I've been walking with God for 30 years. Well, folks, I've been walking with God longer than that. And as a pastor, I'm still learning. You're going to learn too. Forget how long you've been walking with God. I know people walk with God 50 years and they're still babies. They've learned hardly anything. And they don't understand why the Lord keeps testing and trying them. Hallelujah. God was greatly offended when they panicked and rushed down to Egypt. God calls it outright rebellion when we refuse to, when we refuse to rest on his promises. Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel, but not of me. They've not asked at my mouth. They depend on horses and they trust in chariots because there are many, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek the Lord. <clears throat> Beloved, all through the Word, we have been warned that we're going to go through this, and that God tells us that if you're a true worshiper, you're going to be tried more than anything else. But the truth is, the majority of God's people do not rest on the promises. They don't. Now, God saw this feverish activity going on. He saw them rushing down to Egypt. Can you see their ambassadors and their princes? They've got swift horses, and they're all excited. They're going to work out their own problem. Go ahead, get on your swift horse. The Bible said the horses that are following you are just as swift, and you can't outrun your problems. There's no place on earth you can outrun what you're going through. Wherever you go, it's still there. Because the horses, the Bible said, that after you are swift as your horses. Just about you think, oh, that's all over. You turn around, there it is. Still following you. No, you can't outrun your problems. And, you, and, and these men panic. They're trying to outrun their problem. Look now with me. I, and here's the heart of my message. Verse 18, chapter 30. God looks down. At it, and he says, and therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. I'll wait. Look at me, please. God says, okay, you don't need me right now because you're so busy doing it yourself. I'm just going to wait. I want to be gracious. I want to hear you. I'm ready. I, I have a plan. I'll do it my time and way. I'm testing you to see if you just sit and wait and rest. Get off your horse. But he said, and this is the reason why God has not answered many of you. Because you're still so busy trying to work it out. Figure it out. And Lord said, okay, I'm going to wait till you exhaust all your human effort. I'm going to wait until you completely are exhausted and say, well, to whom shall I go? That's where he wants you. Where you are hopeless in the flesh. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no program, there's nothing on the face of the earth is going to help you. And you say, all right, God, I quit, I resign. You do it, you do it. <clears throat> David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my sorrow before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. God said, come on to me now. 
and pour out your soul. Tell me what you've tried. I understand. I've followed you. I've watched you. The Lord said, wait. I'll wait till you're exhausted. I'll wait till you're tired of trying to figure it out. And you just, you just fall back and say, God, it's absolutely beyond me. I can't fight it. I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. I can't, my finances, my family, Lord, it's there. It's been thrust upon me. I have to just endure it, but oh God, you're going to have to give me strength. You have to figure this whole thing out. And the Lord said, Let, let's, let's go on. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to wipe away your tears in the next verse. For the people that dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. For he will be very gracious <laughs> unto you. Uh, he was very gracious unto thee at what? The voice of thy cry. And when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. <clears throat> the first message, uh, uh, it was the second message I heard Pastor Carter preach. When a cry becomes a prayer, is that it? And that's when I got on my car phone and called him to come down here and preach, which led to his being here. And I know he preaches this, and I know how diligent I preach it. But folks, somehow, by the Holy Spirit, it has to find its mark today and change us as a people. God cannot build a strong church on people who are not convinced that God is on their side, that God sees and knows all, and that he alone, by faith, to those who call and cry to his name. Folks, I don't do anything anymore. Anything that comes my way, you know where I go? I don't get on the phone. <clears throat> I don't call Pastor Carter. I don't call any pastor anywhere on the face of the earth. I don't even sit down and talk over with my wife. I love her, but I, I don't take my problems to her. <clears throat> my wife, I love her. She, she can't touch that space in me. She can't help me there. She can't heal me. We can encourage one another, but it doesn't touch that spot. And so I go into my study and I shut the door. Or I go out, get in my car and go to Pennsylvania and go up on a mountain. And I'll spend three or four hours just walking and crying my heart out. I unburden my whole soul. I tell him everything. I weep, I cry, and I say, God, you said and I use this very verse, you said, when I cry, you'll hear me and you'll deliver me. And I'll tell you after, when I come out, when I come out of that secret closet or when I come away from that walk with God, <clears throat> there's something inside of me that can settle on this in quietness and confidence is your strength. There is strength that comes. God reassures you. Then you're not looking to the arm of flesh. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to talk it over with anybody. That doesn't mean you're a law to yourself or that you're just a loner. But then when you come out, you're talking faith. You're talking God's on the throne. You're not trying to figure anything out. But folks, God has waited and waited sometimes on me. And He's going to stand by and wait. You can, you, you can, you can pray for eight hours a day. You can seek God with all, all that you are in the flesh. You can read chapter after chapter after chapter. You can read whole books. You read the whole Bible. But if you don't have faith in His promises, in His Word, nothing's going to happen. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. And they shall be to you a shame and a reproach. You turn to the flesh... It ends in nothing but shame and reproach. But oh, I love this. He will be very, not just gracious, but very gracious to you at the voice of your cry. And when he hears it, he will answer thee. All right, before I close, now go to chapter, uh, chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. And the, the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. How many of you are going through that right now? Bread of affliction? Water of trouble? Where's your hand? Am I preaching to myself? I said, how many of you are being tested and tried? Raise your hand. Quit hiding. 
Well, there's still some of you hiding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't apply to you today, get the tape by Wednesday it will. <laughs> Verse 20, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, who gives it to you? The bread of adversity, the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but then I shall see thy teachers. And folks, you know what this is? This is revelation. This is, who, who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. These are revelations of the Holy Spirit. Will never, won't be hidden to you anymore because you're trusting in the Lord. They're going to be revelations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you now. He's going to lead you through. He's going to tell you how and what to do. Sometimes you just say, stand still. Don't do anything. And then he will give you direction. There'll be a revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. And you'll be standing there, but you won't be standing still. You'll be learning. There'll be a process of learning. Your teacher will not be hidden anymore. Nothing will be hidden from your eyes. You'll be learning. Verse 21. And thine ears shall hear word behind thee saying, This is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand. And when you turn to the left, he said, I'm going to make your path clear to you. You're going to know and understand. And folks, I don't have time. You go through the rest of the chapter and it's all about how God's going to bless you and prosper you in the, in the spirit of Christ and the glory of God, how he's going to lead you and give you the bread of increase. Hallelujah. He's on the throne. He's not going to fail. Some of you need a baptism of faith this morning. You need to quit figuring things out. Some of you haven't slept good for a long time. God wants to give you a Holy Ghost sleeping pill today. <laughs> that you can go to bed tonight and rest and say, Lord, you take it from here. Will you stand, please? Now, beloved, look my way. I've been in the ministry long enough to understand that God doesn't speak like this unless he has reason. He knows what he's doing. The Holy Ghost knows what he's doing. If I'm convinced of anything, it's that. And he's trying to accomplish something in your heart. First of all, I want you to know if you're going to seek God with all your heart, you've got today to settle this matter. You're going to be attempted. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. You're going to be persecuted. How many understand that now? The closer you get to God, the more fierce it can get. I tell you what, though, the Lord won't keep you in that condition. He comes to deliver. But do you understand now the reason why he waits to answer? He's waiting for you to quit figuring it out. He wants you to quit running around trying to solve your own problem. He wants you to just give him simple childlike faith and say, Jesus, everything I'm in right now is beyond me. And I know some of you need strength. It's not that you doubt the Lord. It's not that you uh, have any intention of ever leaving or wounding him. But in the flesh, you're weak. Some have only been saved a year or two, maybe. You don't understand. It may be that everything's going well, but something inside. The enemy comes at your faith. He comes at you. He comes at your family. He comes with worry. He comes with fear. And those are the battering rams of the enemy. Fear. Guilt, condemnation, and so many things. He just batters and batters and batters. What are you going to do? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to stand on his word? He said, I'll make a way of escape. I will. I'll keep you from falling. And I'll present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. I will. I will. I will. And that's what faith rests on. Oh, God, you do it. I'm telling you, I stand here now because he's brought me out. 
He has delivered. He brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Hallelujah. God wants to bring everybody in this church this morning out of your pit of despair. He wants you to walk out of here with a song in your heart, joy in your step, having committed everything to him, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. I want, first of all, the first invitation up the balcony here on the main floor, those first that are going through a severe attack. You'd have to say, I'm like the children of Israel. The enemy has surrounded me. The battering rams are on me. And I, I have just been tried and tested as never before in my life. I'm really going through it, Pastor Dave. I want you to get out to your seat first. Balcony, go to either uh, side of the stairs and come down any aisle. I want to pray that God this morning give you a great victory. That He'll lift this burden from your heart today. <clears throat> if you're backslidden, if you're not right with Jesus, come and follow these that are coming. Say, I, I, need, I need to come back to my first love for Jesus. Maybe you've never been right with God. Come and make it right right now. God will deliver you. Please move close. And move in close because there will be a lot of people coming. All right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You that are standing here, that came forward, Holy Spirit just spoke something in my heart. I don't think we realize how serious and how, uh, what a storm some of you are going through. I'm going to ask a question I feel led the Holy Spirit to ask. And this is not to be showy or anything else, but to show how serious it is for some of you. How many of you have gone through it so badly lately? The enemy's even whispered to your heart, there's no purpose in living. You might as well take your life. Raise your hand, please. Raise it high. That's what I thought. That's why the Holy Spirit laid it in my heart. Have you been coming here for how long? Nine months? God's going to give you a great deliverance this morning. That will never come again. Isn't the Lord wonderful that He knows what you're going through and He prepares a precious word just to lift you out of that. And it reminds you how much He cares. Huh? Isn't that wonderful? Now I'm going to come against these lying spirits. I'm going to speak the word of faith. I'm one of his shepherds. He's anointed me for this. And I want you to know, I want you to believe the Lord, but I want you to believe with me that as I pray, God's going to break the hold of this lying spirit that's trying to bring you down. The devil only holds you through lies. Once the lie is broken, once it's exposed, he has no power, he has no authority. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you to just lift both hands. You don't have to weigh up. Just, just, that's, Lord, I surrender. Father, in Jesus' name, I come against every principality and power of darkness. I'm asking you, Father, to bind and rebuke every lying spirit, every lying spirit that has come against the children of God and those who have been cold and backslidden, those who are going through trials and temptations. You're the great deliverer, and I speak the word of faith right now that you break these chains. Every demon power, you're commanded to depart in Jesus' name and go your way into the abyss. Go your way. Break these chains, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Break this chains. Break the power of these lies. As we begin to praise you, come now, Holy Ghost. Encourage, a spirit of encouragement to place the lying spirits, to replace the spirit of the devil, the spirit of God, and the spirit of encouragement. Now just tell him you love him right now. Worship him and let the spirit of God come upon you. Holy Spirit, fall upon this church because we trust in the living word of God. 
Lord, we have taken your authority now over all principalities and powers of darkness, the lying spirits of hell that would deceive. And I speak against every thought of suicide that is here this morning, that those thoughts never return, not one shall be lost to this demon of, of suicide, this demonic influence. In Jesus' name, I bind that spirit. I bind it in Jesus' name. And that spirit... I'm going to read one verse to put a foundation for my message, and we'll go from there. Hallelujah. We'll pray then. So, uh, let's go to Leviticus, the 27th chapter, verse 32. And here's where our first introduction is to passing under the rod. And beloved, we're all going to pass under his rod today, this morning. We're going to pass under his rod. You have your Bibles, choir? Yes, good. Everyone, wonderful. Verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. All right, hear it again. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come upon me with might and power and authority. I have nothing of myself, but through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost, the word shall go forth, unadulterated, pure, and holy. Sanctify me, Jesus. Purge me. I take your authority over every demon power, every principality and power of darkness, because nothing, nothing shall hinder the word of God from going forth today. Nothing. God, let us have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are open to hear the living word of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right, I've introduced to you now a Holy Ghost concept called the tithing rod. All the flock of a sheep, if someone was going to tithe his flock, and all flocks, all herds had to be tithed, they would take the herd into the sheep coat, and there'd be a narrow door, and there would be a tenth sacrificed unto the Lord, given unto the Lord. The tenth was tapped and given to the Levites. It was a holy, uh, uh, the, the, there was a rod that the Levite had, a long rod, and he dipped it in vermilion, that's red paint, or okra, and every tenth was tapped with that red paint and belonged unto the Lord. In fact, the rabbinate describes it like this. When a man was to give the tithe of his sheep or calves to God, he was to shut up the whole flock in one fold, in which there was one narrow door capable of letting out one sheep at a time. The owner stood by the door with a rod in his hand, the end of which was dipped in vermilion or red ochre, when the tenth one came, he touched it with the red color, and it was received as the legitimate tithe. He was not to see whether it was strong, weak, or anything else. Even if it was a weak one, it would pass through, and God would touch it, it would belong unto the Lord. Now, I want you to go to Ezekiel 20. And you're going to see prophetically how this is prophesied to happen in every generation, especially the last day. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Ezekiel 20. Folks are going to go through a lot of scriptures, so bear with us. Ezekiel 20. You might want to write these scriptures down as you go. I hope you have a pen. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Now, I want you to go to verse 37, please. Verse 37. I hear the leaves still rustling. I'll wait for just a moment. Ezekiel 20, verse 37. Here it is. I will cause you... What? to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will cause you to pass under the rod. All right, God's going to she separate sheep from sheep. Go over to Ezekiel 34. Turn right, Ezekiel 34. Let's begin verse 22. Let's go to verse 20. Ezekiel 34, verse 20. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle, between the lean cattle, because you have thrust with the side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns to have scattered them abroad. Verse 22. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall be no more prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. 
How many see that? I will judge between cattle and cattle. Now, folks, something is awesome and terrific, uh, terrifying is happening here in what I've read to you now. He's judging between sheep and sheep. I want you to know before I go any further that many Christians are not going to heaven. Those who call themselves Christian, many who believe they are sheep, are not going to be saved. They are not going to have the red touch of God's mark. They're not going to be tapped. Only a remnant, the Bible says, only a remnant. If every generation, only a remnant has come through. And this is very important to understand. And the Lord now says, I'm going to gather my people. Now remember, there's a final judgment day when we all stand before God. But he said before then, judgment will begin in the house of God. There's a judgment that begins before the final judgment, and that judgment is already underway, beginning in the house of God and among the ministry and then all over the body of Jesus Christ. And that is happening now. He said he's going to gather his sheep into a valley of decision. Now, folks, many have believed that the valid decision is whether or not you or I am going to decide to follow Jesus. That's not what the valley of decision is about at all. The valley of decision is the decision he's going to make, who is going to be tapped, who passing under the rod is going to get the mark. The valley of decision is his decision, it's not ours. It's those whose hearts are perfect toward him, those that he sees and he says, that's mine, tap, put the mark on, that is mine. That sheep belongs to me. That sheep is going to green pastures. And we'll talk about where it goes. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Joel three fourteen and 16. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark. The stars will lose their brightness. And the Lord will roar out of, out of Zion. And that's exactly, he said he's coming. And Yahweh will judge. Yahweh is Jehovah. Now, why are all these being gathered right now to be judged. Look at Ezekiel 20. Go back to Ezekiel 20. I want you to uh, read verse 33. Begin with verse 33 now. And here's the picture. Get this picture in your mind, please. As I live, saith the Lord God, surety with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. I will bring you out from the people, will gather you, the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the hand of Egypt, land of Egypt. And so I will plead with you, saith the Lord. And I will there cause you to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Look at me, please. God says in the last day, and this is... Uh, Jeremiah saw it, Isaiah saw it, Ezekiel saw it, all the prophets saw it, a gathering of God's people before the final judgment, where the Lord would decide who were His. And some would be cast into a situation that will be described as we go on a little further here today. Now, of course, the day is coming. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's a great gathering. Every one of us must appear before God in Zion, according to Psalms 84.7. But Christ is gathering His church right now in the wilderness of judgment. He's going to undertake a one-on-one -on -one face to face judgment. He said, I shall judge you face to face, Ezekiel 20, 35, as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. And I'm telling you that that judgment has already begun. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? The judgment first in the house of God. The Lord arises to contend, and He arises to judge His own people. The Lord enters into judgment with His elders and the princes of the people. And the reason was because they have what I call the spirit of Herod, who heard John the Baptist gladly, but obeyed nothing he said. And the Lord says there are going to be many in the last days who come and love to hear the prophets. They love to hear the watchman warn. They love to hear the sound of powerful preaching. They love it in their hearts, but they go out and disobey, and it never changes their lives. God is now contending with His household because nothing seems to move many of His children anymore. The trumpets are sounding of the prophets. The watchmen are crying out their warnings. The end of all things is at hand, and yet the majority of God's people are still at ease.
They're not hearing the word of God. And God says, I've had enough and I'm going to bring my people into judgment. I'm going to bring them and I'm going to search their hearts. And he's now contending with his household. Once you go left to Ezekiel 7. Ezekiel 7. Verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And my eyes shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thy abominations shall be in the midst of thee, you shall know that I am the Lord God. Look at verse 14. Speaking of the watchmen and the prophets, they have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle, for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. Folks, look around you. What do you hear? What are you hearing in your spirit? It's one who says, I'm a child of God. What are you hearing? Are you hearing the trumpets? Are you hearing what the prophets are saying? Are you seeing what's happening to the nation and the world? Wars and rumors of wars all over. Yugoslavia is gone. Russia is torn apart. Ethnic wars all over the face of the earth. Are you hearing the sound of the trumpet? The watchman is warned. I've stood in this pulpit now for seven years as a watchman. I've heard people say there's no prophetic message from this pulpit. There's been an everlasting prophetic message from this pulpit. There's a prophetic message going out to your heart this very moment. You've been listening to the watchmen. The watchmen are warning. They're sending letters. They're sending messages. They're on radio. They're everywhere warning that the end has come. Judgment is at the door. Our nation is collapsing right under our noses. Why are people sitting in front of their television sets laughing? Why are people no more awake? Why are people still lazy and not seeking the face of God? Do you hear the sound of the trumpet? I hear it in my heart. I've heard it and I'll never stop hearing it. God help us when we quit hearing the sound of the trumpet. He said the trumpets are blaring, but people are not going out to the battle. Why aren't Christians forsaking their idols? I want you to go to Ezekiel 8. You said you love the word, beloved? Verse 17. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. They've returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the brands to their nose. Therefore also I will deal in fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Look at me, folks. Here's what the prophet is saying. He said, the warnings have gone forth. God has proclaimed that he's coming soon. He's proclaimed the warning. The watchmen have warned. But the people who are holding on to their sins... We're, we're putting a twig to their nose. And in, in those days, in this society, the worst thing that you could do to show disrespect was to pick up a twig, hold it under your nose, and flip it. Now, we don't use the twig. We use the thumb. And what God's saying, my people are thumbing their nose at me. They're thumbing their nose at my word and my warnings. They're not listening. They're putting the twig to their nose. For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And, Lord, they put the brands to their nose. They put the brands to their nose. Now, none of us believe that we're like that. None of us believe. But, folks, when you hear the word and don't obey the word and just let it slots off and go your own way, it's putting a thumb to your nose at God. That's what the Scriptures say. You're thumbing your nose at me. The Lord says, Come out from among them, be ye separate and clean. Touch not the unclean thing, and have no fellowship with the works of darkness. Shun the very appearance of evil. Love not the world nor the things that are in the world. And yet we still have Christians who know that and sit under Holy Ghost preaching and can sit in the presence of an awesome God and the Lord Jesus can be manifesting His presence and they walk right out and they're not married and yet they're going to bed with their sweethearts. 
There are Christians that come to this church and go to some of the dirtiest, filthiest movies in this city. I don't know how you can say that you are not thumbing your nose at God when you can sit and watch any kind of a movie where God's name is taken in vain, where the name of Jesus Christ is mocked and ridiculed, and you sit there and you take it. You don't walk out of that movie. You're thumbing your nose at him, he said. You're thumbing your nose at him. Porno. Lust. Gossip. Slander. Singing about light while still walking in darkness. God said, I'll deal with you in anger, not sparing, no pity. I'll put an end to this abomination. And the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of that marking of sheep in the spiritual realm. I want you to go to Ezekiel 9 now. And I want to show you another marking that's awesome. Ezekiel 9. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man with a, a slaughter weapon in his hand. Now look this, folks. There's six angels there, and they have slaughtering weapons in their hands. But one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshing hold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. The Lord said unto him, Go to the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem. Set a mark upon the foreheads of who? Of the men that sigh and that cry over all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But not, come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. Folks, look at me, please. That never happened literally, will never happen literally ever. This is a spiritual picture the prophet Ezekiel is seeing down the quarters of time to our very day. And there are six men, six angels are going forth because God is judging his people now. He's marking those who belong to him. He said, I want you to go through the city. The city is the city of God. That's us, the new Jerusalem, those who claim to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the Lord is saying, go through this people. Go among them and find those whose hearts are sighing and crying over the sins in this house, the sins of the world, the sins of God's people, the sins of their own heart. Go put a mark on their forehead because they are mine. And so the angel of the Lord goes through the whole place and he puts a mark on the foreheads of those that belong to him who sigh and cry over the abominations. First of all, the abomination of their own hearts. Folks, I have never been able to preach against sin in this pulpit till I've examined my own heart before God. And there has to be in every one of us the examining of our hearts. There has to be an openness to the Lord. Because, beloved, He's coming to mark those who sigh and cry. First over their own abominations, and then over the abominations in the church and in the abominations in the land and in the world itself. Do you sigh and cry over those abominations? Are you sighing and crying over your own? But then he says, those who are not marked have no pity, don't spare, and put the slaughtering mark upon them. Now, folks, what that means spiritually is a slaughtered life. It means a life of despair, despondency, depression. A terrible slaughtering a slumbering, blind sheep passing under the rod one by one. Now, oh, folks, I want you to get this picture. Ezekiel sees it. Jeremiah saw it. And I'm seeing it, and I want you to see this picture. <clears throat> We're gathered in this one great sheepfold, and there's one door. And the Holy Ghost stands there. Jesus is watching the sheep go by. And the sheep are going under the rod, because the rod is just stretched out. It, it falls and taps certain ones. 
And here come the sheep passing by. And the, the shepherd would, could be pastor. He said, no, 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 that, mock that one. What, what a wonderful person. And the Lord says, no. He prophesied, he cast out demons, he did mighty works. I don't even know him, pass it. Yeah, but Lord, she prophesied, she spoke in tongues. She looked so holy. She's full of bitterness. Pass. Here they come, one after another, they go by. And every once in a while, down comes the rod and the red paint on the sheep. They're passing by. And Lord said, no, the Holy Spirit says, no, don't mark that one. Slander. Gossip. Never will change. Move. But Lord, he's a preacher. He preaches with such fire. The strong man was never bound. He gave his sins, but he didn't bind the strong man. Move him. There's so many going by, Ezekiel cries. Lord, too many righteous, too many are going by. Are you going to damn them all? Go to Ezekiel 20. Verse 37. And I will cause you to pass under the rod and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I'll bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go you, serve every one to his idols. Because you see, those sheep that are not being marked, he says, send them out. Let them go to their idols. They won't change. Let them alone. Jeremiah, all you're preaching, Ezekiel, all you're preaching can't affect them anymore. Let them go. Let them go to their, let them go out to the mountains and to the rocks. Let them go out to their shattered lives. But they're not mine. Go, you serve everyone his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. I want you to go to Ezekiel 9. Verse 8. Let, let's start with verse 6. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Verse 8. It came to pass while well, they were slaying them, and I was left. I fell upon my face and cried and said, O Lord God, will thou destroy all the residue of Israel and the pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great and is full of blood in the city of perverses. And they said, The Lord hath forsaken the earth and the Lord seeth not. Ezekiel's crying out, O God. So few are being marked. So few, so few were being marked. Are you going to slay them all? The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very great, and it's filled with blood. 
And the Lord commanded the marking angel to begin in the sanctuary. God showed Malachi that the ministry first would be melted and purified, and he will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, refine them like gold and silver so that they may be presented to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And folks, that purifying process is happening in all of us right now, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. I want you to go to Jeremiah 6, because some people who are going to be purified and put in the fire are going to hold on to their iniquity, and the Lord is going to reject them even though they go through the fire. Jeremiah 6. Now, folks, I want you to get this picture clear in your mind, if you will, please. Beginning verse 27, Jeremiah 6. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and to try them. The Lord said, I'm going to test my people. They're all grievous revolters walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are corruptors. The bellows are burned. The Lord said, I'm going to turn up the fire. I'm going to heat it with my bellows. The lead is consumed. He's putting us into the fire. And the founder melteth it in vain, for the wicked are not plucked out. In other words, the wickedness of the heart is not surrendered. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Now, folks, that's a picture of many people going to be tested and going into the fire, and they're not going to let go of their of their sins. They're not going to let go. And the Lord says they're going to be rejected because they can't be refined anymore. They are rejected silver, according to the Scripture. Look at Jeremiah, go to Jeremiah 8. Verse 5 and 6. Why then is this people of Jerusalem backslidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit, they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes to the battle. The Lord says, there, there will be a people in the last days who don't acknowledge any sin whatsoever. Say, what have I done? God help me. God help all of us to acknowledge our sins before the Lord, before we pass under the rod. And folks, the Bible talks about a dread release, that there are going to be some. I know people don't like to hear this, but you know he said not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God. And that there's going to be a blindness, there's going to be a deception fall upon many, many Christians. God help us, I've got to, to, to get this through to your spirit somehow. I want you to go to Ezekiel 20 again, back to Ezekiel 20. Look at verse 38 again. I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. Now, folks, that's often rebellion in our own hearts. It's a spiritual condition that many of us are going through. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter the land of Israel. You shall know that I'm the Lord. The Lord says they're not going to go into fullness whatsoever. And God talks about giving them over to a dread release, to a shattered life. Remember what the Scripture says in Romans that there were a people who knew God but didn't acknowledge Him as God. And they had a form of godliness without the power. And he says God gave them over to reprobate minds. He gave them over to reprobate men who once knew God. But they were filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip. Without understanding, unloving, unmerciful, insolent, arrogant, boasters, disobedient, inventors of evil. Folks, that's the shattered life that people are given over to when they pass out of this sheepfold into this shattered way of living. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossipers, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness without power. 
gave a whole day of the sea in church over to a dread release. He said, because you're neither hot or cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. God just gave them over. He gave a whole church over to a dread release. He said, no, you say you don't have need, you don't see your need. He said, I turn you over. He spit them out of his mouth. And I say there are millions of sin-bound Christians are going to go to hell, including men who claim, many who claim to be spirit-filled because their lives mock holiness. There's no brokenness. But folks, I want to tell you that God's going to have a remnant in the last days. He's going to have a holy remnant. And when they pass through, the Lord, the Holy Spirit says, Mark it. Mark him. Mark her. And down comes the rod. Marks. And these who are marked go with the shepherd into green pastures. They're, they're held here on the side till all are marked. And they're led off to green pastures because the word rod here in Hebrew is shebet, the same word used in the rod of Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Because those whose hearts are right with God, who sigh and cry with their abominations, who acknowledge their sins, are walking in righteousness before the Lord. The Lord knows them and He's going to mark them. And they're going to follow that rod. They don't fear that rod. That rod's a comfort to them because it marked them. And that rod is going to lead them into green pastures beside still waters. It's the same word, that same rod. Folks, if you're walking in righteousness, you need not fear judgment. You need not sit here and fear my preaching. You need not hear, fear any man's preaching. If your heart is right with God, if your ear is clean, your heart is clean, there's no poison in your system, you never, never fear. You should rejoice in what I'm preaching right now because your heart is right with God and you know when you pass under the rod. That blood, red, that red is the blood of Jesus Christ. And there are many who've claimed the blood of Jesus Christ. They've given up sex, they've given up lust, they've given up habits, but they've never bound the strong man, Satan himself. He has to be bound and then he will spoil his goods. Have you had Satan bound in your spirit? Have you had him bound in your heart? Oh, hallelujah. Verse 40, chapter 20 of Ezekiel. For in my holy mountain, in the mountains of the height of Israel, saith the Lord, there shall the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. I will accept them, and, the, I, and there will I require your offerings and first fruits. I will accept you with your sweet savor, and I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where you've been scattered. Sanctify you before the heathen. God says, I'm going to have a holy remnant that are going to be my testimony before the heathen in the last days. They're going to be marked. And you know where they're going to follow him? Song of Solomon, my beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of balsam, to pasture his flocks in the gardens. I'm my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He who pastors his flock is among the lilies. Hallelujah. I wonder how many in this house, I wonder how many of you are going to be led. You're going to be passing under the rod and you're going to be marked because the Lord says, He she has no other desire but me. There's one who's not looking to people. There's one who's not looking to anyone but me. There's one who's totally dependent and cast upon me. Whose clean hands and pure heart, and spirit, and mind, and body. This is mine. This is the holy remnant that's going to rise in the last days. Sighing and crying over the abominations. And the Lord's going to use that holy remnant to be his example in the last day, to be his testimony. Folks, I don't know about you, but I, I don't have time for any of the foolishness anymore because I want his mark on my forehead. I want to be marked by that precious lamb. I want the Holy Spirit to bring that rod down on my back. I want that mark on my neck. Ezekiel twenty forty three, And here's the real testimony Folks, here's whether you can tell whether or not you've received the mark. And these shall, uh, verse 42 first, ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into land, into the country which I lifted up my hand to give to your fathers. There shall ye remember your ways and all your doings wherein you have defiled. You shall loathe yourself in your own sight for all your evils that you've committed. 
Folks, that's repentance. That's total repentance. You look at your life and so God point out anything that doesn't like you and loathe it. You make all your wrongs right and you don't walk among the people as if you're some holy, righteous person. You go among the people in your own weakness because that's when his strength is made perfect. And you loathe yourself. You loathe your sins. And you live in that loathing. Oh, God, by your grace alone, you saved me. By your grace alone. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm no better than the worst sinner in this city except by the blood of the Lamb. And because my heart has been made to reach out to you, oh, God. Love it, we're passing under the rod. You know what uh, shook me up? I was reading Paul, what Paul said to the church. He said that I may present you as a chaste virgin. Now, for, he didn't say as a virgin. There are a lot of virgins. Remember, there were ten virgins and five were lost. It's not enough to be a virgin. In other words, you say, I belong to Jesus. Because you can be a virgin and still lust. You may not have committed the act, but you lust in your mind. But you see, he didn't say, I want to present you as a virgin. I'm not interested in presenting you as a virgin to Christ alone. He said, I chaste virgin, absolutely pure in mind and body and spirit. But I may present you a chaste virgin. Folks, this is not a popularity contest. It has nothing to do with personalities. God called me to New York City for one purpose. And he empowered me to do it. And that's to raise up a chaste bride. Holy and pure and sanctified. I'm not here to get you to love me or I'd love to be loved. I'm not here to in a popularity contest or get anybody to love me. I have to stand before a holy God. I have to have my own hands clean and pure. I'll stand against slander. I'll stand against anything. But I will not let anything hinder me from my call to present you as a chaste virgin before a holy God. You have to stand before Christ. I'll suffer anything. I'll go through anything. But I'm going to stand before you on the judgment. I have to be there as a shepherd. And if this is your church and you belong here, I'm a shepherd. And I have to be called before God and I'm going to be there when you pass under that rod. And many of you I'd like to see touched. I'd say, God, no, please don't let that go. Don't let her go. Don't let him go. Please, Lord, that's my friend. That's my loved one. That's Don't let it happen. And I can't stop it. I can only go up to the point where you pass. And you and I are going to pass under a rod. Say what you will about me. I will stand here between you and hell. Between you and the devil. And I'm not going to let you go without a fight. And you're going to know when you stand before God. There were shepherds in this pulpit who fought every demon in hell for you. Who fought against all the principalities and powers. And gave you the truth. And prophesied to you. And gave you the holy word of God. And stood before you and hell itself and said, stop. Because I don't want you to pass under that rod and go screaming out into a wilderness of despair. The sad thing is some of you will never change. No matter what I preach, no matter who preaches, you won't change. Because you've already committed. But he said those who loathe their sins and hate them. David said, Yes, for God, they're under the blood. He forgets, but I don't. David said, my sin is ever before me. I can't forget anything I've done against him. And I loathe my past. I loathe everything I did against him. And that keeps me broken before him. Do I make mistakes? You bet I do. The one thing I know... God sent me here. God set up this house as a testimony to the whole world that in the last days, 
There will be a godly, pure, and holy people who live in Babylon, who live in one of the worst cities in the world and are, have clean hands and a pure heart. Hallelujah. And walk in repentance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. <clears throat> Do you need to repent? Balcony, main floor. Do you need to repent? Can you pass under the rod this morning? Are you really sure the rod comes down with that red mark? Oh, God, help you to examine your heart. God, examine us by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Examine us. Search our hearts. Oh, God, don't let us say, what have I done? Don't let us say, I've done nothing. Let us say, oh, God, I loathe myself in your presence. Show me my iniquities. Show me the air of my ways, oh, God. Hallelujah. And heal this afternoon. Heal this morning. Bring great healing. Bring restoration. Lord, you want to heal every broken heart in this place this morning. We stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to open the altars. If you need repentance, come on. Just get out of your seat. Balcony, go to either stairs on the other side and just come. And when you come up here, just pour your heart out. Say, Jesus, help me. Oh, God, cleanse me. Purge me. Sanctify me. I repent. Lord, I repent. If you have sin... If you sinned against God or your brother. Move in closer. A lot of people coming. Move in real close, if you will, please. Please move in tight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, pass us under your rod and mark us. Put a mark on our foreheads, Lord. Put a mark on our neck. Folks, in your standard, don't let me put words in your mouth. Come on, have it out with God. You know what to do. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come on, call on him right now. God, come by your, your grace and your mercy. He's merciful. If you'll cry out, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me and heal me. Oh, Jesus, help us as we pass under the rod. Lord, don't pass us by. Don't pass us by this morning. Hallelujah. Don't pass this by, Lord. <laughs> you that have come forward, raise both hands to the Lord. Lift it up. Lift up to the Lord. Lift up your hands. The Bible says, would every man lift holy hands? All right, lift your hands. Pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I need your touch. I need your forgiveness. I repent of all wickedness, of all rebellion of all slander, if anything, it's son like you. Cleanse me, Jesus. Oh, God, I want to be yours. I want to be your sheep. I want to be of your fold. Fill my heart. Touch me. Touch me today because I need you. And I'm reaching to you, Lord. And I have truly repented with all my heart. Now reach out and just love him because he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. Lord, forgive and cleanse and heal now your people. Heal.
and sanctified and purged by your grace, Lord, do a wonderful work in hearts. <coughs> do a wonderful work in hearts. Lord, I pray right now there be true repentance. True repentance. Hallelujah. Lord, take all rebellion out of our hearts against you. Lord, we're not rebel against you. We thank you, Lord, that you take everything that's of this world out. Those, Lord, who are bound by sin, break the power of that sin. We come against principalities and powers of darkness. We come against lying spirits who would try to hold people in their lust. Break those spirits of lust.